Good morning. Again, to those of you here, and we welcome you who are worshiping with us online. As we begin our service this morning, we will start with a hymn, God of Our Fathers, 552 in our hymnals here. historic confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, Children that would like to come down for the children's message this morning. 
Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Enjoying your time out of school? Mm-hmm. Ready for the 4th of July? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good, right? All right, so what did we just do in church? What did we just do? Worship God. And how did we worship God? By singing. By singing, right. What did we do? How did we sing that? Worship. Out of a hymnal, right? We sang out of what's called a hymnal. And in that hymnal, our hymns are written down and the words are written down. And everybody turns to the same page and everybody sings the same words to the same tune. And it's pretty when we do that, isn't it? Right? But if I just said, hey, let's sing a song and everybody started singing what they wanted to sing, what would it sound like? Bad. Good call. That's exactly right. It would be bad, wouldn't it? The pianist would be playing something. I'd be singing something. They'd be singing something. They'd be singing. The choir would be singing. Who knows what anybody would be singing? Somebody might be singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. And somebody might be singing, the farmer in the dell. Who knows, right? And so to keep that from happening, we have a hymn. And we turn to the same page and the same number so that we're all singing together and making a beautiful, worshipful song to God, right? That's why it is so important that we get in the Bible and study the Bible. That's why it's so important that we ask Jesus to come into our hearts and help us to understand how to live as Christians. Because Jesus gave us a specific way to live. And if all of his people live the way Jesus told us to live, then we're all doing God's will. We're all working toward the same goal. And that's to bring other people to Christ, right? But if we're not reading his word and we're not listening to what the Spirit is telling us to do and everybody's doing their own thing, what do you think that looks like? Pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah, it's not, we're not working together. And sometimes we can actually be working against each other because everybody's doing their own thing instead of trying to do God's thing. So it's important to remember, we don't want to pray and say, God, bless all my plans. What we want to do is pray and say, God, what is your plan for me so that I can be doing what I need to do? And we work together as Christians to do the things God needs done. Okay? And that comes by studying the, the Bible and praying for Jesus to help us understand what to do. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us the Bible so that we can understand what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be one of your followers. And help us, Lord, as we continue to grow in stature, to grow in understanding, and to grow in our spirits so that we can be the men and the women that you need us to be. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Do we have any unspoken prayer requests this morning? Just lift your hand. Right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, as we come on this morning to worship you, we come with freedom on many of our minds. As we prepare, Lord, to celebrate our Independence Day, help us to remember that it is a gift. That it is a gift dearly paid for by so many men and women who were willing to die so that we could have the freedoms that we have now. And help us not to take that for granted, Lord. Neither their sacrifice nor your great grace that enables us to maintain this. Father, help us to hear the call you place on our lives, to truly open ourselves to your guidance, to your direction, that it may be your wisdom that we follow and not our own, that we, Lord, may seek out your plans rather than asking you to bless ours so that we can truly come together so that we can truly 
begin to become one nation under God. And then we can be indivisible. And Lord, we just pray that you would guide and direct our leaders, our elected officials at every level, from townships to cities to counties to states to our government. Lord, help them make wise decisions. May they be influenced by counselors who will give them righteous choices to make. We will encourage them to do what's best for all people. And Lord, we are so thankful for the blessings you have poured out on us as your church. And we know, Lord, that it is through us your will is done and accomplished. And so I pray for more grace that we may have the strength and the wisdom and the courage to live into the lives you have called us so that we can be faithful in all things. Lord, we pray for those who are sick, those who are struggling with illnesses and disease. We ask your great healing hand to be upon their lives and their bodies. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving this morning and ask that your Holy Spirit would bring comfort and peace and strength to their hearts and minds. And we pray for those who are struggling, Lord, that they would be picked up and encouraged and blessed and their needs met by your people, acting as faithful, good stewards of the grace you've poured out upon us, that your name may be glorified and your will accomplished. And as we continue to worship you this morning, Father, we lift our voices together in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray as we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second hymn this morning is 543, and our hymn is here, O Beautiful for Spacious Sky.
624. Let us now praise famous men. And our fathers and their generations. The Lord apportioned to them great glory. His majesty from the beginning. There were those who ruled in their kingdoms. And were men renowned for their power. Giving counsel by their understanding. And proclaiming prophecies. Leaders of the people in their deliberations. Wise in their words of instructions. Those who composed musical tunes. And set forth verses in writing. Rich men furnished with resources. Living peacefully in their habitations. All these were honored in their generations. And, and were the glory of their times. There are some of them who have left a name. So that men declare their praise. And there are some who have no memorial. Who have perished as though they had not lived. But these were men of mercy. Whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their prosperity will remain with their descendants. And their inheritance to their children's children. Their posterity will continue forever. And their glory will not be blotted out. Their bodies were buried in peace. And their name lives to all generations. Peoples will declare their wisdom. And the congregation proclaims their praise. You may be seated. If the ushers will come forward, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, you have blessed us far, far beyond just our needs. And we are grateful for these blessings. I pray that as we proffer now our tithes and our gifts of love and devotion to your church and her ministry, that you would bless both gift and giver, using all to further the work of your church in Jesus' name. Amen. sing two verses. Y'all may not realize that there are four. We're going to sing the first and last verses of the Star Spangled Banner, for which we traditionally stand as our national anthem. I hope you know the first verse. <laughs> and we invite you, to, well, I'm not, I'm going to, I'm just putting that out there. I'm going to invite you to sing along with us, if you will. And if you know the last verse, I invite you to sing that as well. Thank you. 
Our gospel lesson this morning is from the 8th chapter of John, verses 31 to 36. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise Praise be to God. God. And please be seated. This Thursday, we will celebrate our Independence Day. Anybody know how old America will be on Thursday? Very, thank you. 248 years old. It's a long time, isn't it? It's a long time for a nation to remain free. But when you consider our history in the context of world history, we are still a baby crawling compared to some of the other civilizations such as Egypt or China or Greece or the European nations. And when you stop and consider that as of right now, the lives of four men, four presidents, it spanned the entire length of our country's history. When Thomas Jefferson died, Abraham Lincoln was 17 years old. When Abraham Lincoln died, Woodrow Wilson was eight years old. And when Woodrow Wilson died, Jimmy Carter, who is 99 years old, was toddling around his parents' floor. So the lives of four men can span the entire length of our nation's history. So we are very young. We really are. I saw uh, uh, an article about, uh, they were talking about old buildings and things that have stood the test of time. And there was, of all things, a pub in England. Now, I understand that's different than a bar in America, okay? In a pub, you can go in and get your pint of ale, but you also get food. Families go there and eat meals and things like that. But there's a pub still standing in England that is over 600 years old. The building is still there. Can you imagine that? We're not that old a nation, okay? We're a young nation, and yet we stand tallest among the nations of this world. And the reason for that is the principles on which we were established. In the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, we read, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That begins our Declaration of Independence. And we should celebrate that. We should celebrate our freedom. I know a lot of churches and pastors who say that, that uh, patriotism has no place in the church. Well, they're wrong. It is God that has blessed us with this. It is God's grace that has helped us preserve this and we should celebrate the grace of God. 
We should celebrate our freedom and what it has cost so many for us to have the freedoms that we have, lest we begin to take them for granted. Because with that freedom, we are handed a great responsibility to maintain it. And as Christians, our independence should not make us infidels. We're not set at liberty merely to pursue selfish ends. As the Apostle Paul put it so eloquently, you brothers were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. And what's true for the church is true for society. There is great responsibility that comes with our liberty in order to maintain it. Freedom requires righteousness in order to thrive and to continue. And I hope you celebrate that on this 4th of July. Dwight Eisenhower said, A people that values its privileges above its principles soon loses both. And we're right there. We're right there as a nation. We're just shredding our principles to pieces. And we don't realize that all we're doing is being put into a cage. And we live there. You may remember a story I told a while back about a man, and it was a true story. He bought a, this beautiful tropical bird. He loved the music, he loved the birds singing, and, and, and bought a beautiful cage for it and, and had a special room uh, set aside for this bird, for his guests to see. And the bird sang beautifully for a couple of weeks and then shut up. It wouldn't do anything. It wouldn't eat, wouldn't sing. And he asked the, the veterinarian, he said, I don't understand what's wrong. And the vet came and he said, there's nothing wrong with the bird except that it, it needs a bigger cage. So he bought a bigger cage that was two-thirds the size of that room and the bird was happy. It started singing again and it, it was eating again and flourishing and that lasted for about three weeks. And the bird quit singing again and the bird quit eating and he, he, he said I don't know what to do he said I can't I can't put a bigger cage in my house what am I supposed to do I don't want the bird to die and he said well take it to the zoo they've got a, a huge aviary and I'm sure they would be thrilled to get such a an exotic bird you know to add to their aviary so he did and the zoo was happy to take it and he went back a few weeks later and the bird had a little problem adjusting but it was doing fine and he went back a year later to the zoo and he went and visited the aviary only to find out that that bird was being treated trying to mend a broken wing. And when he asked them what happened, they said he just kept flying into the glass dome over and over and over again, trying to get a bigger cage. And so many people in this country live the same way. They live their whole lives just trying to get into a bigger cage, not realizing that that they've given up their liberty, they've given up their freedom. And as soon as they get into a bigger cage, it lasts for a little while, and then all of a sudden they realize that it's not enough. They need bigger, they need more, they need more. As a people, look at us. The earth isn't big enough, is it? Our world is not enough. Hey, we've gone to the moon, right? And now where are we going? To Mars. There's never enough. It's not big enough. That's the mentality that so many of us have. And the truth is, there is no real freedom in the things of the earth. It's never going to be big enough. They only make for temporary happiness until something better comes along or until society tells you you need something newer. You need something different. Don't dress that way anymore. Now, do this. Wear your pants halfway down your legs, you know, all kind of stupidity. And people jump on the bandwagon. Did you see just one or two people doing that? No, tons of them. As soon as some new product comes out, it's going to be the biggest thing for Christmas. People end up their bank accounts to run out and get this stuff. It's a little bit bigger cage. And we don't realize that we are enslaved to this stuff. We're enslaved to that idea. 
We are enslaved to serving mammon, the stuff of the world. But what Jesus was telling these Jews that believed in him was that he's offering a freedom that is neither bound by or dependent on anything in this world or of this world. He is offering truth. Truth which if anyone receives it makes them free from all the things that are limiting their true joy and peace. He's offering complete freedom. His blood, salvation, frees us from the guilt and the penalty of our sin. But Jesus is offering us freedom from these other things that are binding us. All the things society says you should be and you should do and you should have and you blah, 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 blah. blah. Truth of what really matters. Truth of God's great love for us. Truth of what it is we really need. And when we acquire that, joy is ours. Peace is ours. We're going to celebrate our freedom from Great Britain under a tyrannical king. 248 years we have been trying to work out what that means to be an independent republic. We still have the biggest portion of our people in this nation who do not realize that we are a republic and not a democracy. We practice democracy in our elections, but we send people to represent us. And we are a republic. If we were a democracy, then every law that came up Every person in this country would have to go vote in the poll. We'd never leave the polling booth. We'd be there from dusk till dawn for all the laws and stuff people were trying to get published and passed. But we don't do that. We elect people to go and represent our best interests. And if they don't, we elect somebody else to go and replace them. We have fought foreign enemies to protect our freedom. We even waged a civil war to keep states from leaving the Union to have their own freedom. We're still trying to figure all of this stuff out. And now we have gotten to a place where our own government has decided that they're not capable of defining totally what that freedom really is or means. And the truth is, if they're not capable of defining what freedom really is, then they poss cannot possibly protect your rights to all of it, can they? In fact, there are a whole lot of them fighting to take your rights away from a lot of them. Freedom is, is, that is granted by our government is as good as the paper it's written on. As long as they decide to extend it to you, then it's yours. Since we've been afforded these freedoms by our Constitution, we have groups and, and lawyers, constitutional lawyers, who have tried to change it, twist it, pervert it, remove some of it. They try to convince you that you just need a little bit bigger cage and that they're just the ones to provide that cage for you. But it's still a cage, folks. And that's not true freedom. But it exacerbates a problem that a lot of Americans have had for quite a while, this insecurity and this feeling that they're trapped, that there's no real recourse to right things, that they're not even able to articulate what right is. I mean, we, we, we're, I just, you know, we get into fights because we can't define what a man and a woman is anymore. People. Foolishness is the rule of the day. But then again, God told us that, didn't he? The wisdom of man is foolishness in the eyes of God. That's what the scriptures tell us. And that's why we're not to lean on our own wisdom. We're to look to God's wisdom. We're to look in this book and find the truth that Jesus Christ has given us and embrace that truth so we can find real freedom from all of the foolishness going on around us. The only true source of freedom doesn't come from any document written by man. It doesn't come in any denomination. 
It only comes through Jesus Christ. Christ alone can make things right in your life. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. How do I get that truth? He just told you. Abide in my words. Live in these words. Embrace these words. Let them enter your heart. Think on them. Pray on them. Let them change how you think. Let them change how you see the world. How you treat one another. How you understand your relationship to God and the great love that he has for you. Let me ask you this. How long has it been since some teaching of Christ, something in this New Testament, has so affected you that it has changed your heart? That it's changed your mind? That it's changed how you live in some way and drawn you closer to God? Taking you further spiritually than you've been before? Because Jesus' word does that. It's a living word. And it does that throughout our lives, not just at the moment of salvation. That's just the start. We have a whole journey then of growing in Christ. And his word is constantly challenging us, calling us to a higher level of righteousness by showing us a deeper level of humility and compassion. His word is alive. And it will take root in our hearts and our minds. And it will grow to produce new levels of faith in us. New understanding. New ways of seeing this life that make us realize how short this time we have to get it right really is. And how long eternity is going to be. And that means we need to make sure... We're choosing the right destination for our eternal life by living fully in his word. And if we will do that, if we will fully live into this word, then we will know the truth that sets us free. We'll know the truth about salvation that frees us from the guilt and the penalty of sin. We'll know the truth about God's love for us that will forever change our relationship with him and how we approach him in prayer how we seek him out and search him, we will know the truth of the power of the Holy Spirit that has been poured out on all flesh, God's own presence with us and within us to bring change in our lives and in the lives of those around us. The truth about what really matters in this life and what really doesn't matter at all. And you'll be surprised at how backwards some of our priorities can be. And we will know the truth about what grace really is. And how it frees God's people from the bondage of sin and law to live extraordinary lives through grace of joy and peace. Because these come only through the freedom of grace. The grace of Jesus Christ. And Anything else, any compromise that we try to make with the teachings of Jesus only takes us back into slavery to sin. His word is truth, and to compromise the truth is to lose it. Listen one more time. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. <clears throat> Why are we so willing to be enslaved to the constructs of society? Cast off the mantle of slavery and put on the mantle of truth that is found only in the word of the Lord and you will be slaves to this no more. You'll be free through the blood Jesus shed for you on Calvary, through the living word that he has taught us, which the Holy Spirit reminds us of and gives us the power to understand and to live out. And it's all because of the love that God has for you. And the love that he calls you to have for one another. Not because of anything he needs from us. There's nothing you can give God 
that he doesn't already own. It is entirely because of what he offers us through his love. It's a lesson we miss time and time again because it is so pure and because it is so simple. And for some reason, we've come to expect that anything worth investing ourselves in has to be complicated and always comes with strings attached because we're still thinking in the terms of human ways, not in God's ways. The stuff of the world doesn't edify or satisfy, it corrupts. People matter, not possessions. Love is the only acceptable response to the gift of salvation that Jesus offers us. That is our litmus test for discipleship. The depth of your love for other people and not for yourself. Jesus said, they will know you're my disciples by the love you have for one another. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. We became a great nation because of the principles we were founded on and because we were a righteous nation. And to be righteous is to care for the least of these, the sick, the imprisoned, the stranger, the poor, the lost, we who are busy doing God's work need to be prayerful enough to discern what it is God is working on and join with him and be part of his work and his plan, not asking him to bless ours, but seeking his will for us. With half of the world living on less than $8 a day and with hatred, disunity, and moral degradation going on everywhere in this country. People are saying it's going to take an act of God to turn things around. And they're entirely right. But God is acting because he has sent you and he has sent me. We are the body of Christ. We're the only entity in existence with the power and the authority to turn it all around and change it. The church, us, who have been given the presence and the power of God through his own Holy Spirit. And if we will only listen and be guided by him, we will make all the difference. We are his hands. We are his voice. We are his feet. We are his heart. Be faithful, church. Be faithful to love one another as he loves us. Only when we're free from all these deceptions of the enemy and see clearly who God is calling us to be as his people, as the church, then we can help others begin to see the truth. We need to break the cycle and proclaim that real freedom is only found in Jesus Christ. Our founding fathers knew that. And everything we say, in the, from the Pledge of Allegiance to the patriotic hymns we sung and the one we're going to end with, they acknowledge that it is God, our Creator, who has given us this. Who was it that endowed men with these inalienable rights? Our Creator. And what do we say in that Pledge of Allegiance? And I know we've said it so long, it's become rote. We don't pay attention, and we say it wrong because we put the pauses right where we are told to put the pauses. And so we say we are one nation under God, indivisible, with, and that is wrong. That is not how it's written. We are one nation under God, indivisible. You hear that? We are only indivisible as long as we are under God's protection and we are following God's will. One nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And only when we are indivisible under God will there ever be liberty and justice for all. May God bless America. And he will do it through us. Our closing hymn is 547. My country, tis of thee.
saving grace of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our risen Lord and Savior, and the unity, fellowship, and power of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forever and give you true freedom. And Lord, as we go from a time of worship to a time of fellowship, I pray that you would bless the food to strengthen and nourish our bodies and the fellowship to the nourishment of our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 